Hello everybody. Welcome to EPG Patshala, the lessons on culture studies. This is Pramod Nair of the Department of English, the University of Hyderabad. In today's lesson, we are going to be looking at the production and consumption of culture. You might wonder whether culture is something to be produced and consumed. Culture is something we don't quite define as a consumable or producible commodity. It's not as though it is a thing. But within cultural studies, culture is not something that is naturally available. It is the result of a series of processes that include technology, people, ideas, and more importantly, politics. Culture is produced along with a whole series of signs, stories, narratives, and as we will discuss, values. The idea of production of culture, which begins to make its appearance in the writings of the Marxist critic Raymond Williams, and later is elaborated by Stuart Hall and others, involves the production of culture, not only in terms of the material objects, what we call things, but in terms of a system of signs, stories, symbols, and eventually values about those objects. That is, we take cultural production to mean the production of a system of things, values, and signs that inform not only our practical function, but also our social relations, our engagements, our everyday life. It involves the making of our individual and collective identity. In other words, what we are looking at is, it's not just the production of a thing I wear or the thing you use to play a game or to engage in a leisure activity. We are looking at the production of a system of cultural values that determine how we interact with each other, with the world around us. Therefore, it is important to see cultural production as primarily relating to our everyday life and the system of ideas, ideals and ideology in which those objects and processes are to be located. In other words, what we are looking at when we look at cultural production is an entire chain of events. It's not just how a particular brand of fruit juice, a particular video game or a particular shirt is produced. It is to do with the system of values that are embodied or manifest in that particular product. The production of culture partakes of the capitalist mode of production. It is hinged upon the demand supply system, which is not actually saying anything new because capitalism does do that. Um, when you think in terms of consumer surveys that organizations conduct before a product is launched, this is precisely what they're doing. They're looking at the demand for a particular product. They're also looking at what customers expect of a product. Now, when we say we expect something of a product in today's lifetime, today's lifestyles and today's practices of leisure, we are not looking only at the functionality of a product. Cultural production and cultural studies is interested in the values we attribute to the use of a particular thing. Why should I use this? Not because it is just useful, but because it adds to my sense of emotional integrity, it adds to my sense of who I am, and it determines the social relations within which I am embedded. In other words, cultural production argues that products, material objects, and things are embedded in the very lives, personalities, and identities of the people. This is partially connected to a domain within culture studies that is called material culture studies where people like Daniel Miller, commentators have proposed that we should not see things as just things. We need to see things as they are elaborated and connected to our lives, our identities. It is not just me as an original being and then the thing, but it is me plus the thing. We go together. Let's look at the elements of cultural production. The first is obviously elements of production. This involves the manufacturing unit, the official structures of distribution, marketing, the product survey, the product promotional campaigns, the advertisements, and all the apparatuses that helps make a particular product. Technology, of course, plays a primary role in this. So does the circulation of capital and the making available of a space for these. But what is important is that as a product is produced, 
and sold and distributed, what you are selling is not the product alone. You are selling something more, something more than just a thing, not just a waterman pen or a particular Louis Philippe shirt or this brand of drink. You are selling something else. Therefore, the Marcus Strand in Cultural Studies speaks about the production of an object and the cultural reproduction of a sign. This requires some elaboration. Mass media in which cultural production is located has the uncanny ability to transform a thing into an endless repetition of that thing. In other words, what we see within cultural production in the cultural studies approach is that we have the endless ability to replicate whatever it is we want to buy in terms of images. These images that are commonly known as advertising owe its origins to the Victorian age of advertising actually. Uh, the boom in industrial uh, production and the manufactured goods and the uh, desire to own more luxury products actually furnished the basis for the boom in advertising as well. With the digital and with the mass marketing strategies of the internet age, what you are first sold is not the object but the image of the object. What we need to understand is the product and the consumer are separated or distanced in terms of the images that circulate between them. In the age of mass media and production, what we need to understand is that the image or the sign, which is the technical term used in culture studies, mediates between the product and the consumer. So between the manufacturing of the product and the consumption of the product lies a vast sea of signs. The project in culture studies is frequently to look at the rhetoric of that sign, the discourse of signage that enables us to form certain opinions about the product even before we have consumed the product. What I want to get across here is a very crucial point. Our experience of a product does not start with the obtaining of the product. Our experience of the product begins when we begin to consume the sign of that product. Our experience, our anticipation, our emotional attachment to a product begins well before we have acquired it because the sign mediates between the product and ourselves. It drives our imagination, it increases our anticipation. This is why perhaps the largest industry is not the production of objects but the production of signs. In the late 20th century, especially in the digital age, more money is spent producing signage of a product than the product manufacturer itself. Precisely for this reason, that the aim is to develop, is to, de is to energize our imagining, our anticipation of the product well before we get hold of anything in our hands by way of a product. The best example would be that of the Apple iPhone, whose launch is perhaps three months later, but the advertising begins much, much earlier. What is being done here is a constant hiking up of the anticipation about the next launch well before the product is out there. We do not even know what the product looks like, but the whole appeal of the product lies not in the thing itself, which is the point I'm trying to make. This is precisely why we speak in terms of the production of the product and the cultural production of values or signs because the sign is what enables us to experience it in a different way. To phrase it slightly differently, the sign or the semiotics that we study of the discourses of the signage mediating between us and the product is the organization of our perception. It's the organization of our response to the product even before the product is here. Therefore, the task in culture studies is to take signs very seriously. What do they tell us about the product? What do they tell us about the manufacturing? But most of all, what do they tell us about the consumption end of things? This sign system is what is studied under advertising cultures. It's studied in discourse studies, all of which become a part of the larger project in culture studies. Now you might very well ask, what's the connection between the product and the imagination of the product. Let's spend some time talking about this. For a very long time before culture studies arrives on the scene and before the work of Raymond Williams, the Marxist critic, 
production was always associated and related to economic processes. It was deemed to be the making of a product after we have spent money, we have designed something, then we have created a technological process, and then the product is out there. It's only with the arrival of Marxist writings on this kind of area that we have begun to associate cultural values, cultural production with economic processes. The question we have to ask is therefore a very basic one in the Marxist view of things. When we buy a health drink, are we buying the product or are we buying a whole series of value systems along with it? Ideas about risk, health, pathology, safety are manufactured even before the product gets manufactured. What the Marxist strand within cultural studies points to is that the science seem to have taken a life of their own. The science have multiplied in such an extensive fashion that the entire form of thinking, what I have called the organization of perception, is structured around the product even before the product is available to us. The system of science and the system of values therefore precede the arrival of the product, which is why the question of imagination. What do science do? The science tell us a story. Consumption begins when we first consume a story about a product. Consumption begins as an act of imagination. To go back to the example I gave you, the iPhone, which in the recent past has perhaps been at the center of more advertising uh, revenue than any other brand we can think about. Why do I need an iPhone? What does an iPhone do for me? How does it contribute to what I think about myself? These, please understand, are not questions of the product. These are questions about cultural values, about symbolic values. These begin as acts of colonizing the imagination. Oh, if I get this, then I will be like that. If I acquire this, this is what I will appear to be. Now, this does seem a rather crude and rather simplistic way of breaking down the entire process of consumption, but it's a very effective way. Stuart Hall and others have spoken about the circuit of culture. In the circuit of culture, this circuit consists of the production and consumption of culture, but mediated by a system of science, which is what I am emphasizing here. For any product to sell, it must first appeal to our imagination. And well before the product is at hand, it's the sign that appeals to the imagination. What I've referred to as the colonization of the imagination is nothing but the appeal to the aesthetic and the emotional uh, imaginations of all human beings. Let me divert a little bit from what I've just said into a specific area of inquiry. However much we might choose to think, our imaginations and our emotions are not completely individual. They are determined by who we are, the caste, class, community, nation, race we belong to. And therefore, we share our imaginative processes with other people. In other words, I am asking you to think of the individual imagination as participating in also a social or cultural imagination. The advertising targets the individual via the collective and vice versa. If a culture a community finds something appealing over a period of time this percolates into the individual the vice versa is also true the best example of such a cultural imagination that determines how we think about ourselves would be nationalism nationalism is not an individual product it's something we imagine collectively similarly for cultural studies it's important to note that we never seem to think anticipate imagine or sentimentalize on our own. We participate in a larger cultural process. For advertising to be effective, it must reach a larger number than just one or two individuals. For obvious reasons, they want to sell it to as large a number as possible, which is why I deliberately use the term the colonization of the imagination. But what I was cautioning you in this slight diversion is that this imagination is also a social activity. It is not something we indulge in on our own. Which is why we have a component like the social significance of consumption, which involves discussions of lifestyle, identity and community. An individual's consumption patterns are never his or her own alone. Like I just offered, 
It's something we share. It's something we draw upon. Think of a concept like peer group. What does a peer group do? A peer group not only becomes the collective locus of desire, ambition, principles and policy. A peer group is also a place whereby little eddies, little currents of imagination are at work. Advertising targets communities. Cell phones, for instance, invariably seem to target the youth. It's not that the older generation does not use cell phones or they are not interested in technology. It is just that the appeal to an individual imagination works at both the individual and the collective levels. For instance, the question of lifestyle, and increasingly you have a concept within sociology and management studies called lifestyle management. Lifestyles are not something one adopts entirely on one's own. Lifestyles are things we consume as part of a larger cultural process or what is increasingly called a cultural code. Whether it's dressing for work or dressing for leisure, we participate in a collective ritual of dressing up. This is what I'm trying to emphasize. This dressing up is not entirely arbitrary or individual based. It is not strictly my choice alone, but it's something we all agree to do formally or informally. Therefore, we need to now understand that in all the discussion we have been doing so far, we have not spoken about economics. That is the point I'm trying to emphasize. When we speak about production now, the economy, the wealth, the money part is only one component. No disputing the fact that economics is at the heart of it. The manufacturer doesn't make anything just to make you feel happy. He makes it so that he makes money. But the point is, he can only make money if you are convinced enough to buy whatever he is making. And like you, several others should feel convinced that they should buy it. So in the process of the production of culture, economics is one crucial integral component, but it is not the sole arbitration device through which we measure the effectiveness of a process. Cultural production looks at the cultural angle to our consumption of a product, by which we mean questions of lifestyle and values and so on and so forth. What are the cultural values associated with customers, with consumers? It would be very easy to say, I buy something because it suits my taste. But as sociologists like Pierre Bordeaux have shown, taste is something we develop over a period of time. Taste has very specific class markers. People of a particular class share similar tastes. So it is not something I can say, this is just solely mine. Cultural production is interested in the ability of any manufacturer to generate a system of science that several people of a particular class believe is individual to them, but yet is shared. What we call lifestyle management. A product that med is mediated by a system of science is something we consume and the assumption being that I consume it myself, but actually is not quite the case. Consumption, people would say, is therefore a ritual, an exercise, a kind of common shared practice. They would be right. But the important thing to understand is it is not unmediated. What cultural production processes show to us if we are tackling them via the cultural studies approach is that there is no unmediated consumption. You don't pick up a thing for the first time. You have always heard about it before. You have been told about it before. You have been anticipating it before. For cultural production, what is important is that a product is embedded within an entire system, not necessarily connected to the product, but connected to the cultural values of the social order, of the class in which the product is being pitched. Therefore, to go back to the example I gave you about cell phones, why is it that cell phone advertisements focus primarily on youth cultures? Is there an implicit connection between a cell phone and youth? There isn't actually. The implicit connection is what we are calling mediation. Youth like certain kinds of phones. The youth use cell phones in a certain way. The youth demand certain kinds of phones. These are assumptions which are mediated, anticipated, and constructed through the rhetoric 
of cell phone cultures. The rhetoric suggests you as an individual need to buy this so that you will feel in a particular way. But the irony is this has been told to a million people. Each one thinks I am doing this for myself. But that is precisely the power of discourse. For cultural production, the construction of lifestyle values, of values such as risk, safety, security, are primary because what finally buys a product is not an individual but a system of values. It is because the product fits my system of values, which I of course share with several other people, that I find this useful. Speaking as an academic, I would say, think that, for instance, the kind of databases that are being sold to us, the kind of footnoting software, bibliographic search software that are being sold to us, comes with a particular tag. Several other academics like you have found these things to be useful. And my immediate way of looking at it is, oh, so people all over the world seem to find this useful for their research. How is it that I am not using them? These tools should be mine as well. Now you see, what is being appealed to is not me as an individual, but me as a professional. And my immediate take on it would be based on a system of shared cultural values that all academics have. You know, we need something to help us with the bibliography. We need something that software will have, some kind of software that will help sort out these glitches. What we are talking about here is a community, not an individual. So what we have learned here is that Cultural production is not only about the economic processes. It's not about the technological apparatuses. It's not even about the product itself. Cultural production as studied by cultural studies, especially the more Marxist oriented cultural studies, is interested in the mediation between a product and a consumer. In a quick summary, we would say that cultural production is interested in the modes by which a product is sold to a consumer. And I'm using the word sold in a non-economic sense. The, the common word would be marketed. Cultural production via the culture studies approach is the manufacturing of opinion, sentiment, anticipation. It's a construction of an imagination which will lead you to invest in the purchase of a product. For cultural studies, cultural production therefore is only partially about the product. It's more focused upon the process through which the consumption occurs. Cultural science, or advertising as it's commonly called, become ends in themselves. What do I mean by such a claim? In the 20th century, particularly after the boom in electronic media, the sign is consumed on its own system of values. The French philosopher Jean Baudrillard spoke extensively about the role the sign plays. That is, we don't necessarily need a product. What we look at is the multiplication of the sign and the sign as an end in itself. In most postmodern analysis, one of the things you will notice is this extraordinary emphasis on the language, the grammar of a visual sign or the language of a particular advertising campaign. Um, it's a well called for and uh, uh, an overdue analysis actually, primarily because right from the 19th century when advertising uh, as a major industry opens up in England and the rest of the world, what was being given was a picture, a song, a representation or a symbol, not the product itself. The products were far fewer than they, were, they are now. Now in the age of mass industrial production, the number of products also goes up. What we are looking at, therefore, is an analysis that says the consumption of the sign equates with the consumption of the product. That the circulation of the sign is an almost parallel, independent process. In many cases, that is the end in itself. You don't necessarily get to the product. The consumption of the sign is good enough. Now, what do we mean when we say that? What we are talking about here is that when you consume a cultural sign, you consume not the product, but the values associated with the product. What we are looking at here is the system of symbolic values, symbolic significance, that over a period of time have begun to be attached to certain things. Um, 
you can say this in the case of say national flags and national symbols as well over a period of time we begin to recognize this without necessarily a footnote or a glossary primarily because the value has circulated for so long we don't consume a flag we consume the value associated with the flag we don't consume a national anthem we consume the system of patriotism the ideology of a national identity that are associated with these so the circulation of the sign is an end in itself it does not require a product Baudelaire would in fact argue that you never really get to the authentic or the original because it is mediated by so many layers of signs the copies the multiples of signs that mediate make sure you never get to the product itself that the, the layers are the ones that you actually consume and you consume it as original the example would be say for instance how many of us have actually seen the mona lisa but we all recognize the mona lisa just as we recognize the uh, portrait of william shakespeare we have never seen either of it but we know what we are looking at because we have consumed a sign called william shakespeare or we have seen a visual replication of an original which very few have seen of the mona lisa now the mona lisa is a cultural icon it's a cultural icon which we all recognize because we share the language uh, we will be looking at something called ritualized consumption but this is precisely that the consumption of a system of signs is ritualized for people with marxist or feminist leanings this is itself the subject of analysis for various reasons take the beauty industry for example or the health industry in both cases what we are looking at is the consumption of signs which then become the value systems in other words our ideals of beauty whether it's fair skin or a certain height or the number of uh, abs you can show off uh, if you are a model the clothing you wear has nothing to do with the individual body because the values then seem to stand on their own for feminists for instance the ideal or the ideology of motherhood that these products manufacturing units uh, portray through science are worrying because they establish these as norms now you will remember we spoke of a term cultural values what is frightening is that these cultural values begin to be accepted as the truth because a large number of people come to believe in them for feminists in particular this is worrying because norms of beauty of what constitutes the feminine become entrenched in other words we are back to what we have been always saying within cultural studies we need to start thinking in terms of the ideology present in a so called innocent advertisement primarily because the system of cultural values is never innocent the system of cultural values is what get ingrained in society as social values as national values and eventually those become discriminatory and or exploitative thank you